list is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 1 You are going to hear a conversation between a student and an academic advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Hello there, you must be Jane. Please come in. My name is Mrs Dunstan. Hello Mrs Dunstan. Pleased to meet you. All right now, let's see. Now, you're interested in attending university in Canada, is that right? Yes, and I have a lot of questions to ask you. OK, but before I begin to answer your questions, I need to ask you a few questions first. Now, your major is... Engineering. Mechanical Engineering. Right, and where did you graduate? I graduated from the Beijing Institute of Machinery in July 1998. I completed my bachelor's degree. OK, now I'm assuming you'll want to continue studying in that field, am I right? Actually, I'd prefer to do an MBA if possible. But if I have no other choice, then I'll continue in mechanical engineering. OK, now are you familiar with the requirements for an MBA degree? Yes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. I think I need to do well on the GMAT, and I'll definitely need the TOEFL or IELTS, right? That's right. You'll need at least 600 on the TOEFL, or 6.5 on IELTS. In addition, you need to have completed a bachelor's degree too. Did you take the GMAT yet? No, but I plan to take it in August. The requirements for a master's degree in engineering are a little different. You'll need to take the GRE and, of course, the TOEFL or IELTS. I see. And when do I start to apply? The best time to start the application process is in November or December of the year prior to your intended year of study. Application forms are usually available in September or October. Which schools in Canada offer the MBA degree? Of the approximately 50 universities in Canada, 20 offer an MBA. Here's a small booklet summarising Canadian university programmes. You'll find all the information on page 22. Great. Thanks. And how about tuition and scholarships? Tuition for MBA programmes has been steadily increasing. Some universities now charge the full tuition, meaning that there is no government subsidy. Those universities cost about $10,000 per year, and it's a two-year programme. Other universities are still government subsidised, so the tuition is only about $4,500 per year. In terms of scholarships, usually the top five students entering the MBA programme are given a generous scholarship. All other students have to pay the full fees. International students have to pay the full tuition. That's $10,000 per year. Oh, is it very difficult to get into an MBA programme? Yes. In fact, the competition is very strong. MBA graduates have a pretty easy time finding a job, so many students are eager to do the program thinking it will guarantee them success in their careers. Well, it sure does sound like an excellent way to start a promising future. Um, what is the school year like? Classes begin in September each year and finish before Christmas. They resume after New Year and finish at the end of April. And after April? Why, that's your summer holiday. Sounds great. I want to thank you, Mrs. Dustin, for all your help. I really do appreciate it. You're very welcome. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me. You know my number, right? I sure do. Thanks very much. Goodbye.
That is the end of part 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two geography students talking. An older student, called Howard, is giving advice to a younger student, called Joanne, on writing her dissertation. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hi, Howard. I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, hi, Joanne. Yeah, they're keeping us really busy on the postgraduate program. Mm -hmm. But how are you? You'll be starting your dissertation soon, won't you? Yeah, tutorials start next week. I've got Dr Peterson. You'll remember it all from last year, of course. Oh, it's not something you forget easily. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, although I didn't expect to enjoy writing my dissertation, and in fact I didn't really find it much fun, mm. I wouldn't have missed the experience. I found it really improved my understanding of the whole degree programme, you know, from the first year on. Right. So what are you doing yours on? Glaciated landscapes. Although I haven't decided exactly what aspect yet. Mm, I did mine on climate systems, so I can't help you much, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be fine once you start your tutorials. Dr Peterson will help you focus. I know, and he'll set me deadlines for the different stages, which is what I need. My concern is that I've got tons of material on the topic and I won't be able to stick to the word limit, you know. Mm, I remember I had different concerns when I was doing my dissertation. Last year? Yeah, before my first tutorial I did a lot of fairly general reading because I hadn't fixed on my topic at that stage. Mm. I actually enjoyed that quite a lot and really improved my reading speed, you know, so I was getting through a lot of material. I was frightened I wouldn't remember it all, though, so I got into the habit of making very detailed notes. So, did you find your tutor helpful in getting you started? Yeah, we certainly had some interesting discussions, but it's funny, I saw a brilliant programme about climate change, and it was that that really fired me up. Oh. It was talking about some recent research which seemed to contradict some of the articles I'd been reading. Mm. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. So you say your tutorials start next week? Yeah. Well, the first month's crucial. You've got to meet your tutor and decide on your focus. But don't become too dependent on him. You know, don't see him every week, only when you want to check something. Right. Once you've got the focus, you've got to get reading. Mm. It's helpful to look through the bibliographies for all the course modules relating to your topic. And get hold of any books you think you'll need. I haven't got much money. I mean, get the books from the library. Far better. 
And I suppose I should prepare a detailed outline of the chapters. Yeah, absolutely. But don't feel you have to follow it slavishly. It's meant to be flexible. Okay. Now I'm someone who likes to get writing quickly. I can't just sit and read for a month. <laughs> Not like me then. <laughs> But if that's what suits you, you know your natural approach, then you really ought to start immediately and write the first chapter. Right. Now, Joanne, about the library,、mm. it's worthwhile getting on good terms with the staff. They aren't always helpful with undergraduates. I suppose they focus on postgrads more. Maybe, but show them you're serious about wanting to do good work. And what if I can't find what I need? Well, there's interlibrary loans, borrowing books from other libraries, but I've heard it isn't all that reliable.、Mm, you're right, but you probably won't need it anyway. Be positive; <laughs> the library is likely to have most things you need. And during the dissertation writing period, you can take out fifteen instead of the usual ten books. Should I look at previous year's dissertations? You can do, but I won't know which are the good ones. The library only keeps the best, and the staff can advise you. Are they willing to do that? Oh yeah. And I'm worried about getting journal articles from the electronic library. Well, have you tried to find any yet? No. Well, you should. It's really straightforward. That's obviously something I'll have to look into. Doctor Peterson will help. Yeah, I know I can go to him if I have any worries. Except he will be away in the second month.、Oh. It's the holidays. You should ask him what to do while he's away. Gosh, yeah, but I suppose I can get a lot of support from coursemates. I know a couple of people who are thinking of doing the same topic as me. Take care. Collaboration can become dependency. I think you'd better see how that works out. What the people are like. You're probably right. About other reading, I suppose Dr. Peterson will recommend plenty of good articles to get me started. One thing I'd find out is what his attitude is to internet sources. Surely not in this day and age. I'd better get that sorted out right at the beginning. I would if I were you. And I've also got some questions about the research sections. How much time I should spend explaining the process? Well, I think that's up to you. You can see how it develops as you're writing. Okay. It's the same with things like time management. That's something a tutor can't really help you with. I agree. So, is there anything else you need me to go over? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a woman talking about a number of different beaches to a group of tourists. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Right, let's move on to the beaches here, which are absolutely beautiful. You do have over a hundred to choose from. They're mostly sandy beaches, and they vary from the largest, which is two and a half kilometers long, to tiny sandy coves. But there are a few that I'd really recommend you to visit. So, looking at this pamphlet, first of all, there's Bandela Beach. This beach is one kilometer away from the old fishing village of Bandela, which is a beautiful spot. If you park in the car park behind it, there's a small path which leads down to the bay. It's very pretty because the whole beach is backed by pine trees, so it's very sheltered. The beach itself is very clean, and the water is shallow and safe. That, together with the soft sand, make it an ideal beach for children and non-swimmers. 
um, a little further round the coast, again to the east, in the eastern corner of the island, is the spectacular Dapolata Beach, which is basically a long inlet. The land around this beach is marshland. It's all marsh. And there's a stream which winds through it, and the stream goes into the sea. And the beach has lovely pale gold sand. Access to this beach is quite tricky, and not for the less energetic. You have to go down a long flight of steps, 190 to be exact. But you'll be relieved to know that there's also a road which winds down to a car parking area. When you're level with the sea, there is a handful of shops and bars, and you can hire some beds and umbrellas. Continuing round the island, just past the tip of Calm, is the next beach I'd suggest you visit, and this is San Get. Why? Because there isn't a beach longer than this on the island. If you want to know, it's exactly two and a half kilometres long, and that's a bonus because it means it never gets overcrowded. It has golden sand and clear blue water shelving into the sea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. It has golden sand and clear blue water shelving into the sea. There are several beach restaurants to choose from and water sports are available when the water is calm. But check first. This beach operates a flag system as the sea can get rough and you should always swim between the flags. There's a large car park which gives you easy access to the eastern end of the beach, but the western end is much quieter and more wild as it is harder to reach. Blanaka is another popular beach just in the northwest corner of the island. It has incredibly white sand and sparkling water. There is ample car parking here and plenty of bars and restaurants. Blanaka has white cliffs all around it and for those of you who'd like a little more to do than just lazing on the beach, there are caves here which you can explore in the cliffs, and you can also dive into the water from rock platforms along the side of the cove. Well, my final recommendation for today is Dissidore. Now, this beach isn't quite as easy to get to as the others I've talked about. It's quite a remote little beach, tucked away here next to Blanaka. You can reach Dissidore by a steep slope which goes over some sandbanks. The beach itself is small and pretty, with reddish coloured sand and some stony areas on its eastern side. Despite being quite small, the bathing is good, and you can also go fishing here from the rocks at either side. It's a good idea to take some food and drink with you if you decide to go here, as there's only one little bar which isn't always open. So, that should give you plenty of ideas to choose from over the next two weeks. And if you have any further questions... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a crater in Australia. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Lake Akraman in South Australia is Armageddon for the purist. No other meteorite impact on Earth has stamped the surrounding rocks with such an abiding, unequivocal geological record of collision, earthquake, wind, fire and tsunami, the giant waves formed by major Earth movements. The story it tells is elemental, without dying dinosaurs or even Bruce Willis to complicate its simple message of destruction. First, the numbers. About 590 million years ago, a rocky meteorite more than four kilometres across and travelling at around 90,000 kilometres an hour slammed into an area of red volcanic rock about 430 kilometres northwest of Adelaide. Within seconds, the meteorite vaporised in a ball of fire, carving out a crater about four kilometres deep and 40 kilometres in diameter, and spawning earthquakes fierce enough to raise 100 metre height tsunamis in a shallow sea 300 kilometres away. Ancient, stable and unglaciated, the bedrock of Australia preserves some of the most photogenic impact craters in the world. Ackerman is not one of them. Half a billion years of erosion has taken its toll. A salt pan surrounded by low hills is all that remains to mark the site of the cataclysm. The true nature of the place dawned on geologist George Williams of Adelaide University in 1979. Gazing at a sheaf of newly acquired satellite images, he saw the small circular shape of Lake Ackerman surrounded by a ring of faults and low scarps 40 kilometres across and an outer ring twice this size. A year later, he made it to the site. On islands near the centre of the lake, Williams found bedrock shattered in a conical pattern that experts consider a sure sign of a meteorite impact. Except for a crater, which had long since eroded, the area was a textbook example of an impact site. In 1985, further intriguing evidence turned up. Vic Gostin, another Adelaide geologist, had been studying a thin band of fragmented red volcanic rock in 600 million year old shale in the Flinders Ranges, more than 300 kilometres east of Ackerman. To his bewilderment, the volcanic chunks turned out to be a billion years older than the shale. Where had they come from? Comparing samples, Gostin and Williams found that their rocks were identical. The red rock in the Flinders Ranges had been blasted there from Ackerman. Later, the same material turned up at sites 500 kilometres from Ackerman. Everywhere, the bands of fragments showed the same structure. Coarse pebbles at the bottom, then a cocktail of silt and sand, then layers of increasingly fine sand distorted on top into a wavy, scalloped pattern. These layers also show, step by step, how the meteorite transformed the floor of an ancient sea hundreds of kilometres away, according to Malcolm Wallace of Melbourne University. First came the earthquake. Travelling at about three kilometres a second, shock waves arrived offshore within a minute or two of the collision, stirring up the water with clouds of silt as the seabed shook. Then shattered rock from the explosion arrived by air. Pebbles and boulders crashed into the water, reaching a depth of about 200 metres within a minute. One day they would become the lower band of the Flinders Rock. Sand took up to an hour to come to rest, finally bedding down with the silt that was also now settling on the sea floor, as the effects of the earthquake died away. This mixture would eventually form the next layer. About an hour after the meteorite's impact, huge waves rolled in, leaving the ripples on the surface that later hardened into rock. Clear as mud is not an oxymoron. In Ackerman, the arid, timeless Australian outback 
has preserved the closest thing the earth can boast to a perfect pockmark, the pinnacle of imperfection. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.